Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Just a quick note before we dive into today's episode. I hope you all got to see the Sunday episode I posted with Sagar. It's a Q&A, AMA, Ask Me Anything discussion episode. You can get access to the full conversation by going to realignment.supercast.com or clicking the link at the bottom of your show notes. To get access to the full episode and support the show, five a month, 50 a year, or 500 for a lifetime membership. Now into today's conversation, you all know one of my favorite topics, especially now when I'm working at the University of Texas, is the state and future of higher education. We've seen a bunch of really big era-defining news events in this category the past year, everything from the debates about anti-Semitism and free speech on campus to broader concerns about student debt and the actual increasing size, scale, and costs of the university system. All this is mixed together into a broader context where society just has less faith and trust in the higher education system as a whole. So my guest today, Nicholas Dirks, is exactly the right person to have that conversation with. He was the chancellor of UC Berkeley, 2013 to 2017, which is basically one of the earlier big 2010s eras of higher education reimagining. So getting into all these topics with him was really, really rewarding. Huge thanks to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. Hope you all enjoy this conversation. Nick Dirks, welcome to The Realignment. Great to be here, Marshall. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you. The higher education university college is Topic-wise, one of my favorites to cover. So what you and I are going to do in an hour or less, not only convince some folks to purchase your book, but we're going to solve higher education as a category as well, too. So I hope that you're uh, good to do that. Um, I, I want to start by asking you to kind of explain a quote that you offer up at the start of the book, because I think it gets to the title of the book itself, but also the perspective that you're trying to address here. The 20th century was a grand century for the cities of intellect. The century, that century, is now past, never to be replicated. That's from Clark Kerr's The Uses of the University. Um, why did you put that at the front of your book? Yeah, so I obviously took from that quote my title, City of Intellect, and did so because I think Kerr really was one of the great visionaries uh, in and uh, pioneers of higher education in the 20th century. Uh, for uh, listeners who don't know, he was a professor of economics at uh, UC Berkeley, but he became the first chancellor of UC Berkeley in 1952. And then he went on to become the president of the University of California system that was during his tenure growing by leaps and bounds in 1958 uh, and stayed in that role until he was effectively fired by Governor Ronald Reagan as one of the first acts of the new governor who had campaigned in part on uh, the claim that he was going to clean up the mess at Berkeley. But that's another story. We'll get to that later. Uh, what Kerr did, in addition to being the steward of, of UC Berkeley during a time when it was almost free, uh, when it became one of the very best universities in America, bar none, despite the fact that it was a public university, uh, was also to build the whole system. He helped create uh, campuses in places like uh, Irvine and Santa Cruz and San Diego and really expanded uh, both the scale and accordingly the access to a higher education on the part of, of California. And it was associated with, I think, California's great growth during the post-war period, uh, the extent to which it became the kind of uh, itself, the kind of you know visionary part of the U.S., uh, led in so many different areas, from uh, arts and entertainment to tech and uh, uh, and the kinds of things that we now associate with the Silicon Valley. Uh, but you know, it was driven in large part by the University of California, by the commitment of the state to the university, and by the great work that Kerr did. Now, in using that uh, quote, I'm also, of course, using the whole quote, not just the title. And the whole quote, as you read it out, and I thank you for it, uh, does express the concern. And these words were written in 2001, just at the end of the 20th century, of course, uh, two years before Kerr died, as a worry as to whether higher education was going to be able to maintain its, uh, its, its great distinction uh, in the U.S. He was especially concerned, of course, about public higher education, but he was also concerned about the real purposes of higher education. And he was 
in uh, his writings, both in the book from which this quote comes and indeed many other uh, works that he published over his career, really eloquent about what those core purposes were. And although he coined the phrase multi-university to capture the scale and just the, the plain size of the University of California, he also always harbored in his uh, in his heart uh, this desire to combine the big flagship research university with the college he went to, which was Swarthmore. That is to say, a small liberal arts college where undergraduates could go and really become versed in the first instance in uh, the kinds of preoccupations and interests of the liberal arts, you know, dealing with questions about the meaning of life, learning about the nature of our politics, our society, our culture, uh, and doing so uh, in a way before specializing and going on either for advanced research or advanced training in a particular professional field. So uh, so Kerr captures, you know, in some sense, the real worry at the cusp uh, of our uh, of the last century and of our current uh, century as to whether or not this great uh, uh, system of higher education, and for that matter, both private and public, was going to be able to survive the stresses and strains of uh, of a new world. And, uh, you know, he, uh, like many visionaries, he he couldn't exactly define what the future was, but he saw that the, the future was going to be different. And boy, oh boy, uh, it has been. I think what's fascinating here and why I'm so obsessed with that quote is so many of our debates within institutions revolve around how much has the world actually changed? And to what degree do we as leaders or actors within these institutions need to accommodate said changes? So in the category of higher education, um, if he's writing this in 2001, that's well before Facebook and social media and the iPhone and massively open online courses and debates about the SAT and declining enrollment rates, the gender gap, et cetera. Those are a lot of the issues we would just say up front are big challenges in the 2020s. He, though, is already saying we need to move on from the 20th century. It's not going to repeat itself in 2001. What was he seeing that was different than the things I just listed? Yeah. So he was seeing a number of things. First of all, he was beginning to see the funding crisis in public higher education. And the University of California, uh, uh, which was very well funded, you know, throughout most of the 20th century, especially in the post-war period, it went through its first really uh, fundamental funding crisis in the early 1990s. And so Kerr, uh, who stayed, you know, very closely connected to to Berkeley all of his life, uh, saw uh, saw the writing on the wall that this was just going to get worse. That um, the kinds of pressures on state budgets. Uh, and combined with a growing disillusionment, I think, on the part of the broad public with, you know, some of the kinds of things that went on in universities was going to be a challenging environment in which to make the kinds of claims for funding of the kind he felt were, would be necessary in order to sustain uh, the great university that that he had known in, in his lifetime. So partly it's about funding uh, that uh, he, 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 he saw there would be issues. Uh, but he was also a very astute critic. Uh, even as he was uh, a great defender of the university and um, uh, really, in some ways, at Berkeley's biggest booster ever, uh, he was also a critic. He was a critic, for example, of the growing professionalization of the faculty, the extent to which many faculty who were successful would uh, basically go to work, teach their students, you know, write their books or articles, but really invest in their own professional success. And that professional success was both academic and also uh, extra academic. And he saw and complained about the extent to which uh, many faculty would really devote much of their career to, uh, to pursuing things off campus, whether it was some kind of professional success in general, whether it was a entrepreneurial activity of some sort. Of course, he saw much of that going on in the 80s and 90s as well. Or whether it was just a kind of, you know, uh, uh, lack of interest in the university as a whole. And he was worried about the scale of these large flagship research universities where, you know, where, where, where the older idea of the university as a kind of universal, as a universal community of scholars who would come together and not be siloed off either in departments or colleges or schools or programs or other kinds of academic units, it was, was, was really to guide the, the future of the university. He had, of course, gone from being a faculty member to being an administrator. Uh, he was unapologetic about 
being an administrator, he never uh, kind of conceded that he was going to the dark side, as most of us have to do at some point or another, if only in jest, uh, because he actually thought administrators had a role and function of reminding faculty that the university was a whole entity. It was a holistic thing that had to be carefully cultivated if it were going to actually continue to serve the kinds of purposes that uh, the students needed, uh, that the public wanted, uh, and that ultimately would be would be good not just for the intellectual and cultural life of the nation, but also for its uh, uh, political and economic uh, sustainability. So I say that because he began to see, I think, in the 80s and 90s, uh, a, a, a kind of growing... Uh, you know, if not disaffection, certainly a kind of redirection of 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 of, of faculty interests and and preoccupations. He worried about the hyper departmentalization of faculty life. He talked about the guild like structure of departments. He uh, uh, and he often uh, you know complained that faculty were uh, and you know he was always a member of the faculty. Always you know this was always spoken in some sense out of love. But he felt that, you know, faculty, particularly at great universities, were especially reluctant to concede that change had to continue to take place. Mm -hmm. Because he wasn't just a conservative at all. In looking back at the 20th century, you would think, you know, he was just kind of mired in nostalgia. No, he was, in fact, aware that the university had to keep changing. He had tried to accommodate uh, his sense of the needs for change as he was, uh, as he was both uh, chancellor and, uh, and then president. But he, he believed that change uh, would be required in order to continue to keep up with, to, uh, uh, to address uh, the needs of the present and indeed the needs of the future. So he was, he was already sounding alarm bells. And you know, he wrote this book uh, called The Uses of the University in the first instance out of a lecture he gave in 1963 when he was still the serving president of the University of California. They were the Godkin lectures he gave at Harvard. And it was a much shorter book then. Every decade uh, for the rest of his life, he reissued the book, added a few chapters, trying to bring it up to date. Mm. Uh, and in the final edition that came out in 2001, he actually, at the end, he begins to forecast some of the things that he sees on the horizon. And he sees even changes in technology. Remember, in the 90s, you have the dot-com boom and so on and so forth. So you have a kind of foretaste of what is going to come with the internet. Uh, and the like. And he was, again, a very, very savvy, uh, very visionary guy. And he was beginning to see that there would be even more competition for the attention of faculty, students, and even the public, uh, and worried about what that would mean for the university. So I think this is where you come into the story. 2014, you become UC Berkeley's chancellor. What is a chancellor. I think people probably have strong conceptions of most broad university titles and, role, and roles, but what is a chancellor specifically? So a chancellor really is basically the university president. Uh, and in, in some universities, uh, uh, they're called presidents. Uh, uh, most universities, they're called presidents. Some public universities, they're called chancellor. Although, again, like any generalization, uh, there are exceptions that prove the rule. The president of Vanderbilt is the chancellor. Uh, and um, uh, and the president, say, of the University of Texas is the president of the University of Texas, but uh, uh, she or he reports to the chancellor of the University of Texas system. So you have chancellors that are at different kinds of, you know, levels in what are often public systems. But uh, just to cut to the chase, uh, yeah, the chancellor of UC Berkeley, the chancellor of UC UCLA, et cetera, they're all basically the presidents of the local campuses. But it's a system. And as such, there is a president of the university system. And the chancellors of each of the campuses report up to the president uh, in that kind of structure. So that's the perfect setup. So I just have a, a bunch of questions that both come from the book, but I think also that would draw listener interest. So as you've spoken a few minutes ago about, um, there are administrators in universities. And when you're talking about a funding crisis, you're not only talking about the, for example, in the 2008 financial crisis and the aftermath, you have all this pressure on state funding systems that plays into the role of there being just less money available for the university system. But also to a certain degree, um, funding is a public endorsement 
of an activity or an institution. So trust and enthusiasm plays a role there. So I think for a lot of folks, they think of a factor that's decreased trust or support for the university. It's the statistic that I know you know, which is we've seen an explosion in the number of administrators relative to faculty at the university system. That is something which I could just see even your most center reasonable person saying, okay, I could see a world where I spend more of my tax dollars on faculty and research and the actual academic purpose of this. But why am I funding all these administrators? I'd like to hear like your kind of thoughts on that topic. Yeah. So uh, it's a great question. And, um, uh, and it's a complex one because uh, the truth of the matter is that there are a lot of uh, reasons why there's been this kind of growth in uh, the administrative uh, ranks uh, across universities, both private and public that have nothing in particular to do with uh, the kind of just um, uh, the interests of a, of a president or chancellor just to hire more people to, you know, to report up to them. Um, uh, and, you know, like all institutions, universities have become more complex. Uh, they've also become more subject to different kinds of regulatory mechanisms that require compliance. Uh, and indeed, as they become you know, bigger and bigger research operations, which uh, really began in the period after World War II. Before that, kind of research on universities was 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 tiny compared to what it became just a few decades later. Uh, there had to be, of course, a whole bunch of administrators who would come in to do everything from running laboratories uh, to uh, ensuring that uh, when money came in from the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health or from other kinds of public uh, uh, funding sources, that the money was used in the right way for the right purposes. And um, you know, a lot of that is just plain old administration of, of, of grants. Uh, and, um, uh, and so you get a kind of growth in terms of administration there. You also uh, uh, get a growth of administrators around students because remember, uh, universities are growing really rapidly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even in the 80s in terms of both the percentage of the population that goes to college and there's the numbers uh, overall. Uh, because, of course, not only are uh, more Americans going to college in the U.S., but more international students are coming to the U.S. as well to, to go to college. So you have, uh, you know, and right now, just as an example, I mean, you have 40,000 students at Berkeley mm -hmm. and you have 1,500 tenured or tenure track faculty. There's a, you know, there's a big disconnect there. There are a lot of other instructional faculty, and we can perhaps talk about the fact that there's been a kind of a adjunctification of, 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 of the instruct of the of the instructor uh, a, a, a category and rank as well. But, uh, but a lot of administrators come in basically to handle this volume of students. So you have, you know, these student affairs. You have you have administrators who are in the dormitories. Uh, uh, there's been a growing. Uh, movement to providing housing for for all students, and that used to be the case in a lot of private universities. But it wasn't so much the case at a place like Berkeley because students would come and live in a co-op where they share an apartment or whatever it might be, and it was actually cheaper to do that for many years until, of course, the housing prices exploded. But you have so, in other words, you have administrators around research, you have administrators around student affairs and student life. Uh, and um, and and you 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 also uh, uh, increasingly have uh, you know universities doing more and more different kinds of things, uh, including in public universities, public service of different kinds. We would have administrators who did things like engage in outreach across uh, high schools across the state of California to try to just basically let young people know who might never have thought about going to college, leave alone to one of the top public colleges in the state, and for that matter, in the world, that they could apply to Berkeley. So you want to, you know, you, you have an interest on the part of the university to recruit more students, to recruit more diverse students, to recruit students from different socioeconomic backgrounds and so on and so forth. Well, that's not going to be done by faculty sitting in their offices or at the classroom level it's been it's been done it's being done by by administrators so what what happens however is there there is a kind of bureaucratization of this whole process and you know administrators often find themselves taking on more and more roles more and more jobs more and more tasks and the way they deal with that is hire more administrators mm -hmm. so uh, uh, you know, and and oftentimes they do so with very good purposes and very good reasons behind them. 
But uh, but I think what there uh, what the kind of concern about what is called administrative bloat reflects is increasingly a sense that come on, it's it's okay to do this if you can afford it. But if it's actually driving up the cost of higher education at the level that it clearly has been uh, at least associated with, there are a lot of other drivers for the cost curve in higher education, but certainly that's one of them. Then you really have to take a hard look and you have to begin to think about what it's okay to say the university should do and what the university perhaps should simply say we can't do. Somebody else should do it. Either we outsource it let students live in dorms that are run by non-university entities, for example. Uh, uh, let them eat in cafeterias that are run by non-university, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, entities and the like. Or, you know, something else that uh, would effectively allow one to begin to reduce this number uh, of administrators. Um, so, again... Can I pause you there? Because that is such complex, a fascinating... But, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, and this is where I think this gets fascinating because to your point, you kind of raise the prospect of there's a world where university says, no, like we will not do this thing. But I think the kind of apocalyptic version of the administrative bloat argument undercounts the fact that in many ways, the administrative growth is in direct response to student parent expectations. Um, so I went to um, you know George Washington University my freshman year of college. So I'm like very aware of how this dynamic plays out. Like GW was a school that through the 1980s was like a, a very good, but like it was a commuter school. Like Harry Reid, before he was, you know, a senator was a he was a capital cop and he like took part-time classes there um to get his law degree. Um in the 90s though, the university started spending more money. It upgraded the dorms, it bought real estate, it actually spent this money that increased the cost, but that actually attracted more students. So I guess the question I'd ask for you basically is, let's just say Berkeley woke up, actually no, Berkeley's brand is too strong. Let's say just like a, a middle, a middle, a good but middle tier public university basically said to themselves, we're gonna dedicate ourselves to reducing administrative bloat as a cost of doing business to lower the cost curve. How much would that, actually save money relative to not making the campus and the experience itself less attractive to faculty, students, because those expectations exist. I'm curious how you'd think about that dynamic. Yeah, well, your experience is actually incredibly useful as a kind of backdrop here, because absolutely, uh, you know, I know the story of, of GW and how uh, you know it, it? It got to be more and more and more competitive by virtue of uh, yeah, uh, offering more uh, uh, and better services to students and better facilities to students, uh, and for that matter, to faculty. Uh, but you know, ramping up the cost, ramping up the tuition. The, the tuition there went you know skyrocketed, uh, uh, and um, uh, and and some people actually claimed, including one of the then presidents, that it helped make it more competitive just because people looked at the price and they thought that was also, you know, the value of, 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 of the education you could get there. So I think we're at a moment now where, and we read about it virtually every week, uh, where one, you know, uh, mid-tier public university after the next is beginning to face major, major financial uh, challenges. I mean, I I'll get to this later, perhaps, but you know, I face major financial challenges even at UC Berkeley with its strong brand because of other things. But you know, this last year we've heard about the University of West Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, on the first uh, response on the part of the university there was to begin to cut back on some of the departments, particularly in the uh, in, in language and 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 literature and and humanities. Uh, and I thought, you know, I thought that was. Um, that was unfortunate because these are really core fields for uh, you know what I believe strongly in, namely you know the liberal arts and liberal education, and that's in that sense of liberal. Um, uh, could not one begin by thinking about paring down the kind of the kind of administrative costs that were part of the university? Now it's easier said than done. Uh, when we had the financial crisis at, at Berkeley, we did we did cut administration uh, 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 significantly, and of course we got complaints. We got complaints from students. We got complaints from faculty. And so the other issue you have to deal with when you're doing that is to socialize what you're doing in a way that, and I mean by that, 
get the buy-in of different kinds of constituents to understand that you got to cut. So if you're going to cut, you're going to cut here as opposed to there. But if you don't cut here, you are going to cut there. And in the, uh, uh, in the process, uh, you have to recruit at least, if not full-throated uh, support, at least understanding of the decisions that you're making about paring back, say, uh, your, your, your administrative expenses. But I think, you know, again, this is going to happen because of the pressures that are out there. And, uh, you know, since 2011, when the amount of student debt in this country went over a trillion dollars, and it's now getting very close to two, uh, there's been a general recognition that, you know, we have to do something serious about bending the cost curve of higher education because it is simply both getting out of reach of too many people and, of course, saddling too many uh, students, frequently, of course, students who don't actually finish their degrees with crippling debt for uh, that lasts uh, sometimes across their entire lives. So I think this is another example in this question of how I think my personal history is helpful. So I kind of vagabonded around the university system, especially in the early 2010s. I went to GW. I went to a local commuter school in Portland. I finished my writing requirement at a community college. Um, I graduated from the University of Oregon, but now I like work um, at the University of Texas. So I've kind of seen, um, and a lot of my colleagues in think tank world like went to like Ivy's and those sort of, so I've just kind of seen the full um, gamut here to a level I think most people don't really experience. So that just makes me ultra conscious of the fact that different universities and colleges serve different functions or have different expectations. So if you're looking at West Virginia, um, that obviously is the flagship state university. Um, but I guess the real question is, does the flag state flagship state university in West Virginia need to have serious language um, language courses. And you had the, you know, a state official in Mississippi who was kind of getting into this debate, basically saying, quote, I think it was, if, you know, you want to study, high, you know, high German, good for you. That's not the business of the taxpayer in Mississippi. Maybe that's the business of, you know, UC Berkeley, but I guess that kind of just gets to the question, like, what are these different functions that are serving across these different categories? So, you know what you're raising there is uh, is is really a very serious question that is both about how universities really identify what their priorities are for indeed how they even uh, evaluate you know those kinds of questions about you know what is critical for uh, for 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 the kind of level of education that they're trying to provide uh, uh, and that's one set of questions and another one of course has to do with uh, both cost on the one side and political uh, interference in the decision-making process within universities on the other. So, you know, and there are a lot of examples like that. You know, I, I'm, I'm partly a historian, partly an anthropologist, and there was a governor of Florida, not the current one, who uh, once upon a time proclaimed that anthropology was irrelevant. He decided that it was irrelevant and therefore the state shouldn't fund it. And either, either the university should charge more for anthropology majors so that people would pay the full cost as opposed to being subsidized by the state or simply not expect to have it there uh, when they went to college. Now, you know, again, uh, when it when it hits you like that uh, on your own home turf, you're, you know, you react and say, well, wait a second, who is, you know, X to say, you know, anthropology is not important, but business administration is. Well, you understand that, you know, there is a vocational element, a career prepared, uh, preparedness element to to all education, but this goes way back. And uh, okay, other hat historian, uh, <laughs> the creation of the flagship uh, of the of the public universities and uh, the the land grant universities in particular, 1868, the Morrill Act, uh, and the allocation of, of vast amounts of federal money to uh, to support uh, public higher education. But the idea was 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 at that point to make it available to a much broader cross-section of the American population than had been uh, able to go to college before, a high quality college education. Now, you know, at the time in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, uh, you know, the, 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 the Harvard colleges and Yale colleges and Columbia colleges, you know, the, uh, the older uh, and, you know, very elite uh, colleges were, you know, were still very limited in terms of what they offered students. They didn't offer vocational education at all. Uh, they frequently taught more students classics than medicine. And that was even when, you know, pre-med was beginning to be offered. 
Uh, and, um, and so there was very little in the way of practical uh, training that students would get. But there was also, of course, the fact then and continues to be the case now, if you got a Harvard degree or a Yale degree or whatever it was, yeah. you were part of a tiny elite, wasn't a big group. Uh, the status that attached itself to your degree helped you get a job, whatever it might be, wherever you might go. Um, and, you know, the um, uh, 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 Abraham Lincoln, who was president at the, at the time of the Morrill Act, who signed it into law, uh, just, uh, Justin Morrill, a uh, senator from, uh, from Vermont, and, and, and others who, uh, you know, who, who thought this was a good idea, uh, really believed that many more Americans should be getting uh, a high-quality college education. Now, they said that you have to have fields of practical training that are made available in these universities. And so you, that's why you get the first schools of engineering, which were mm -hmm. then schools of mining, uh, that were uh, that were all established in relationship to public, uh, mostly land-grant institutions. Uh, but there was also a commitment on the part of the uh, universities at the time uh, to, 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 to have both. You know, that to, to both give a kind of general, you know, liberal arts education, you know, cultivate the citizen, cultivate the individual, give you the kinds of experiences you need to be able to live life in the, in the fullest at the level of the meaning of life. And then to get the kind of practical training to live life uh, in a way that was actually sustainable and where you had a, uh, 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 you had a career that, uh, uh, that could support you and your family. Um, so there was, a, there was a sense of the need for both. And today, and really over the last you know, 20 years or so, in large part, uh, I think, you know, uh, propelled by the effects of the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, you have this kind of growing sense that if you're going to do the liberal arts, it's a luxury. And so maybe it should only be done, you know, at the very, very top elite schools where money is no object and where, in any case, the students will all get, you know, fancy jobs anyway, because they have a network and they have, you know, the status cred that goes with those kinds of degrees and the like. But nobody else needs them. And, you know, my sense, and, you know, you can call me old fashioned, but my sense is that, you know, universities actually continue to have the same kind of mandate, the same kind of responsibility that they had in, you know, 1868, namely to give access for all students who go to college to, you know, some courses where they can really take on some of the questions of what it means to live a full life, as well as get the training uh, to be able to support that full life uh, in a meaningful and, 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 um, compensated job that you're going to be trained to do. Now, those jobs change. Uh, the circumstances of being a citizen, uh, of course, change. Uh, but I think that in 2024, the importance of knowing something, for example, about, uh, you know, not just how you code, but what the impact of artificial intelligence might be for our society or for our economy or for our politics, is just as important as ever, if not more important than ever before. I think where it gets difficult though, and this kind of merges with a, a kind of difficult question of, you know, do too many people go to college in the first place? Uh, because A, let's look at two different periods in American history we've spoken about. So we spoke about the 60s at the start. Um, Reagan, Berkeley, you're in this post GI Bill era where you're also intercepting with Vietnam and the culture wars of that period. And then also like the 1860s where you're seeing the expansion of the land grant um, state universities um, in that context. Those were both periods still where just the university system was expected to educate a much smaller proportion of the American populace. So I guess the question would basically be, is there evidence that if the goal is to understand the future of AI, those more liberal arts adjacent topics, is the university the best forum to do that at the price it's being delivered? Because I, I always was incredibly skeptical of the tech is going to disrupt the university. We're all going to take our MOOCs and not go to college. You know, I miss, miss, people who say that are engineers who don't understand the average college experience for most people. So college could still provide the credential. And I don't doubt that Florida State provides you an excellent credential, but I wouldn't wager, no offense to Florida State, that like the leading thinkers on the topic of AI are going to get there because they took 300 and 400 or 200 level classes at an underfunded department. So 
maybe instead someone's working at a tech company or someone is listening to podcasts like this one or someone's reading on their own. They have so much more access to resources than they would have in the 1860s or even the 1960s. So I'm just curious how you think about that dynamic. Yeah, no, no, it's a really, really great question. And 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 here's what I would at least say uh, for starters, which is that I think um, I, I, I think the the answer to the question is is not you know do too many people go to college, but uh, do too many people uh, are too many people expected to go to college, you know, right after high school uh, for four years. Uh, uh, and then to graduate, uh, and then to know exactly what they're going to uh, use that college for, uh, and do with it uh, what was intended uh, uh, when they went to college in the first place. Because what, and this goes back to what I was uh, talking about with Clark Kerr, and you know, looking out on the horizon of the 21st century as to what was going to change. Uh, you know, we have, you know. Uh, many more what we call non-traditional students now than traditional students, students who take breaks of time, who uh, are not, you know, 17 or 18 years old when they go to college, uh, who don't stay in a four-year college or who start in community college or who wait to start in community college because of different things in life or uh, because of the fact that they grew up somewhere where nobody else goes to college and it doesn't appear to be something that they need to do only to find that increasingly the kinds of skills that you get from a college education are critical for your, just about anything you do. Um, uh, and uh, and I, don't want to, I don't want to minimize the importance of certain kinds of vocational training. And there are other models in the world. You know, we, uh, we know, for example, in Switzerland, that if you're gonna do a trade, right. like uh, become an electrician, you can get a very high quality vocational education uh, and make a good living and have a good life and get a full pension and um uh and 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 be a full you know a few a full citizen of 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 a of that country in every possible way but they have a different system than we do they 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 begin to select uh what you're going to do on the basis of examinations you take when you're 13 and 14 and no one in this country wants that it's very much not our system yeah it's not our system and i wouldn't advocate for it because i believe and of course uh you know i have two kids and uh and 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 lots of friends who have kids and i i i i know that you know uh you know the late bloomer is not an exception uh and uh that 13 and 14 year olds don't necessarily know what they want to do and as they especially don't know what they want to do if they come from backgrounds where they they don't know what some of the options are uh, outside of a, a, a of, of of their own community, so yeah, exactly. I don't think that's an option. Uh, it's not something I would recommend, but I would recommend that we become much more open to different kinds of more flexible structures for higher education, so that people can have on ramps and off ramps. And if they take an off ramp, they can take they can then find uh, uh, another on ramp. Uh, to get back on, it's very hard to drop out of college and then get back in. Now it mm -hmm. shouldn't should be no more difficult than transferring. Uh, you know, this way, actually, the University of California, you know, had a great model that was set up and that Clark Kerr was responsible for enshrining in, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, uh, in an arrangement that was called the Master Plan of 1960, where, you know, a third of the graduates of any class in the University of California are students who enter into a community college. They didn't begin at the university. They start in a community college and then they transfer into the university. Uh, but again, even that is a kind of fairly highly scripted progression uh, through four years, two years community college, then two years in the university. I think we're in a different moment now, and we have to accept people are going to have very different pathways, very different trajectories, and over the course of their lives, very different needs for the kind of training they get. And there will be times when you need to understand how to, you know, how to how to how to how to code a neural network that, you know, ten years ago you couldn't have got trained in in college anyway, because nobody was doing it because it had been shown not to work, at least up until Jeffrey Hinton and his group began to make it work. But the point being that I do believe that we've come to a moment in our history where we have to really be willing to think about fundamentals in terms of, uh, and this relates to cost, but it also mm -hmm. relates to fundamental questions of access uh, and opportunity. You know, there's a, you said this, concept. I want to make this clear for folks. 
um, I feel as if in response to what you just said, part of the transition that a university leader should make, or just advocates of higher education in general, is they should basically say, our model is not this vision that the way to pursue the American dream for folks in this country is for everyone to go to college. Um, it's that some we should aspire to have a country where everyone could get or attain some form of higher education. Because I think when you unpack what higher education is in the way you are here and in this book, it obviously means something different than just a specific vision of if we can get every single or the maximum number of 18 to 22 year olds um, on campuses in this very specific moment, um, we can achieve success. That obviously hasn't worked and that is unlikely to work when you unpack it that way. So I just think like the conception of like what we're defending here is higher education as a whole is just a very helpful one that gets you past some of the, I don't want to kind of say straw men because I definitely think at a poll, I'm not accusing in, um, higher education leaders of using the straw men, but I think for a lot of policymakers at a state and federal level, they used maximum college attainment as a proxy for we're achieving our goals as a country, which doesn't work um, from that perspective. I totally agree. Absolutely. And I, I think that, um, you know, uh, what you say is really, really important because, uh, uh we're not going to be able to change and make more flexible these structures if we continue to measure success in the sector by traditional measures that, you know, for example, what is your graduation rate? Well, you know, um, what is your graduation rate over uh, four years or six years or or uh, or what is the graduation rate of a certain segment of the population over 10 years? Uh, and are they able to, you know, go from one institution to a different institution in order to, you know, get the kinds of things they might need? And they might have to move around and be much more mobile than they uh, than the traditional model would would suggest. And, you know, there's a huge obligation, I think, on public universities for this because traditionally they've been better at this. But the public and the private uh, uh, um, have to work together uh, if this is going to be successful. That's the nature of the system in the U.S. Uh, we have both. They're, 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 they're vitally connected with each other, but they are uh, they're still too um, committed to, you know, the kind of U.S. News and World Report set of measures for how you judge excellence and therefore how you structure your institutions. I think that's so interesting. I guess then the question then is, in order to make this, let's judge by maybe like a 10-year outcome perspective work, it would seem to me that a problem you need to solve is that at too many institutions, um, folks are rewarded I mean, at, for, for too many for too many college attendees for, for their postgraduate outcomes, they're clearly determined by their attainment of the credential versus, let's say, what they actually learned during their period. So you see studies where you'll see that students who made it, um, you know, seven out of eight semesters, um, they for whatever reason like don't finish. Like their outcomes aren't quite as great as people who just finished the entire way through, even though it's pretty debatable whether or not like, you know, for a variety of reasons that eighth semester really made a difference. So if we see a world where we say to someone, hey, look, like go to college like or take some form of higher education, take that course at the community college, you will be rewarded for that experience. And it's okay if it doesn't take you those four or five years, because clearly employers, your community, your own personal self will get such benefit here that you could still think about this along this 10 year transfer framework. So how would you think about maybe without just creating more credentials? Cause I could just see like, well, no, we've given you a certificate of certificates. Like how do you kind of address this dynamic without um, just sort of doubling down on the system more? Well, first, just a, a, a little story, which is to say that a few, not a few years ago, quite a number of years ago when I was at Columbia, we gave an honorary degree to Manuel Axe, the great pianist. And uh, uh, and when, when we got in touch with him to come and get an honorary degree, he said, you know, I never actually finished at Columbia. I never got my first degree. So we <laughs> figured out how to get both the real degree and the honorary degree. Now, he'd gone on, obviously, to have one of the great, great careers in, in music, and uh, didn't seem to be uh, kept back by not finishing uh, his last course and probably his uh, his swimming test uh, mm -hmm. or something like that, which uh, was an impediment for graduation at Columbia for years. But um, but you know, leaving 
uh, leaving that aside, the, what you described is absolutely right. There, you know, the, the 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 kind of life outcomes, the career outcomes, but also life outcomes of those who who finish compared to those who don't get a degree is huge. Uh, whereas, you know, the difference between what they learn is probably uh, unmeasurable uh, and uh, and trivial by by certainly by comparison. Um, I think I think the the answer, though, and I, I'm, 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 I have to use this word, uh, uh, even though uh, you said what you did about credentials. I think the answer is in part to think differently about credentialing. Um, you know, there's the term micro credential, and it's used, of course, to apply to both certain kinds of discrete uh, 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 achievements and also uh, certain kinds of uh, very uh, specific skills or uh, uh, attainments in terms of uh, mastering this or mastering that. Uh, we have to figure out some way to credential people for the work they do so that they can take what they learn and show it in a way that others will recognize as being real uh, in order to allow them uh, uh, to be, you know, actual agents in a system in which if we're going to make it more flexible, they are going to still have to navigate, you know, different institutions at different times. And, uh, and so, you know, I do think that we have to think differently about credentialing. Now, you can, you can make you know, you can make that into as ridiculous a set of outcomes as as you want, and you're absolutely right to say, you know, you could credential everything, you know, every every test you take or every step you make or whatever. But, um, but I think I think you know, if you begin to detach credentials from the idea of the four year degree or uh, the two year master's degree or whatever, you can go a long way to uh, to to helping students effectively, uh, you know, um, uh, gain more, more, more flexibility in, in, in how they're going to work their way through different kinds of opportunities, uh, uh, in their educational life. So I think that's part of it. Um, but you know, it's, it's attached to the opprobrium that we, uh, accord to those who don't follow, uh, you know, the standard model and, uh, that's a cultural shift. And of course, to change culture, you gotta you gotta work work hard over a long period of time uh, and find a lot of different ways to do it. Next question. Speaking of credentials, where do you stand, or what are your thoughts on the SAT debate? So obviously, you had a period, especially after the COVID relating testing difficulties, where uh, and as part of broader debates, we saw a bunch of schools drop their SAT requirements. Now, the Daily from the New York Times is having episodes, but how like actually the debate has opened up again. Um, now that we've been able to kind of like test the outcomes, where do you kind of you don't have to take a quite position, but like where do you kind of see um, the space evolving over the next few years? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it, I mean, it is a really interesting space. And of course, the University of California discontinued the uh, requirement for the AC, for the ACT or the SAT uh, uh, in the early days of the pandemic. And that was, of course, you know, in large part because of pandemic related uh, issues, but it, uh, it reflected uh, a, a little bit of a prehistory of debate about whether the SAT was uh, was really uh, as much of a, a helpful indicator of uh, you know likely success in college as was made out to be. Now the history of the SAT is a really interesting uh, history, and um, you know it's a whole just, other podcast. <laughs> Actually, yeah. you you could do another five hours on that too. <laughs> yeah, you, absolutely. But one book I'll just recommend for your listeners, which is a book written by a former colleague of mine at Columbia. Well, he's still at Columbia. I'm not, but uh, Nick Lemon. Uh, uh, the book is called The Big Test. Uh, and it actually starts with the people who uh, work to create something like a standardized aptitude test, uh, 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 you know, back in the middle of the 20th century. But uh, but that, again, that's for another podcast. Hmm. I think the um, uh, we all know the problems with the SAT. It's, uh, uh, it's not uh, a, a, a sole predictor of success in college. Uh, oftentimes, you know, grades do. Uh, a better job of predicting how well you do in college than uh, than aptitude tests, but um, I, I I actually think it gives you and and we also know that SATs are 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 subject to you know uh, it's not that you will perform the same if you if you go to the you know if you if your parents spend hundreds hundreds of dollars to get you tutorials and SATs and you know you, you, that will help your performance on the SAT I mean that may not help as much as these as the Princeton Review will 
Thank you for saying that, by the way, because it is very funny that oftentimes the very valid critique you make there turns into propaganda for the test prep industry, but is not revealed at all in the actual outcomes. There are not many 400 score increasers. We're up to 50, 30, 40, 60, 80. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly. And, uh, and it's important to, to remember that, but you know, the way I look at it is, um, the, the whole admissions system is so, uh, is so difficult now that, um, a little bit of extra information is often helpful. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, I had this debate at the university of California. I had a different point of view than, uh, than my boss did there about whether letters of recommendation were helpful. Uh, and the president of the system said, yeah, you know, letters of recommendation are, uh, you know, they're kind of worthless. Uh, you know, they just formulaic and they don't give you any real information. But every now and then they do. You know, every now and then you find out about somebody who, uh, you know, maybe there's a reason why they got a D in that course uh, and uh, in their 10th uh, 10th grade. And, you know, maybe you need to know the reason, uh, in their lives that, uh, behind that to appreciate the fact that, you know, when they then got a B and then, you know, in their last year in a, that didn't necessarily bring up their GPA to the point they, they, they would like, but yeah, you know, did reflect, you know, uh, overcoming some real major challenge in their family. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing to know and to contextualize. So I, I'm of the view that, you know, the more information, the better, that uh, certain kinds of standardized tests do allow you to uh, uh, control to some extent for the differences between and among schools uh, and uh, the differences between and among even teachers who, um, after all, you know, grading is, I hate to tell you this, Marshall, I'm sure you've never heard this before, yeah. but grading, grading is kind of subjective. Mm-hmm. I think uh, <laughs> the big... <laughs> I think the big uh, last question here, and you can take this whatever direction you want to take it, is basically you were, you know, leading UC Berkeley during 2014, you know, 2017, which is also kind of, if we're going to kind of put 20th, 21st century higher education into different buckets, you have the post financial crisis environment, right? So it's just like it's 2010, state coffers are running out, you're making these aggressive, aggressive cuts. Um, 2014 to 2017 was though a period where uh, culture wars in the style of the 1980s and early 1990s really reemerged, especially at your university. Sitting in the 2020s, we've clearly entered a new category of culture wars, not merely just like the Me Too debates or like the racial debates, but also where you're seeing those culture war debates intersect with the societal trust and anti-institutionalism of this like post-2016 moment that makes this also really resemble the Reagan moment um, that, you know, Clark Kerr dealt with in the 1960s. So what would just your advice be for the different actors in this ecosystem? For navigating this moment, right? The 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 governors who are ambitious, um, the state legislators who have constituents, the university administrators. Like, what's your broad takeaway for navigating a moment like this one? Well, you know, it's let me kind of back up just a little bit and put a yeah. little more uh, context on 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 the time I was I was I was at Berkeley because I think it. It, it is the case. You know, Berkeley is often a kind of bellwether. It often uh, is out there ahead of everybody else for better and for worse. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that was true in the early 60s when, uh, you know, when Kerr and Reagan, uh, you know, had their little duel. Uh, but I think it was, it was true when I was when I was chancellor. And uh, and even though, uh, you know, it was before the kind of formal launch of Me Too, uh, and even though it was uh, you know, before some of the current issues, uh, uh, certainly around the Middle East, have exploded on college campuses and led to you know such extraordinary outcomes in terms of everything from the ten- life tenure of a university president to mm-hmm. uh, the kind of you know um, uh, public uh, growing public uh, uh, distrust or disaffection with uh, with higher education. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of it. You know, sort of happening in its early phases. So. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it was, it was in part, you know, I actually got, uh, got, got to Berkeley in, in early 2013 and it was, there were still very clear memories of the Occupy movement of protests that were on campus that were sometimes violent protests. And there was still a lot of bitterness about, um, uh, about those kinds of, uh, events and the response of the university to them. Uh, and, um, and yet 
uh, in 2014, when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement, uh, I actually got in a little bit of trouble because I, I sent a memo out to the campus, both celebrating free speech, but also uh, enunciating or re-enunciating campus principles about civility and respect. And so I said, you know, uh, there, there, there's no doubt we, we're deeply committed to free speech, but, you know, free speech would be best exercised in a context in which people could actually have respectful disagreements with each other. And, you know, uh, uh, if anything, I wasn't, you know, sort of loud enough in my support of, of, of free speech, although I, 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 I meant to be, and I, I certainly clarified that in a subsequent memo I sent out. But by 2017, we had, you know, faculty and students who were trying to persuade me to disinvite Milo Yiannopoulos, who had been invited by the Berkeley Young Republicans. And on the grounds that it would cause, you know, it would, it would to have free speech would cause, you know, would cause harm. Uh, uh, to students. And so, you know, even in that short period of time, I saw, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the, the shift from thinking that free speech was absolute to free speech was just a reflection of differential power relations. And, uh, and, and so there was that. I also uh, uh, realized that we had to change every one of our uh, university policies about sexual harassment, because the whole set of norms behind the rules that we used to have changed. And they changed even before Me Too was formally launched, as I as I noted. So, so I saw a lot of this, and indeed, we ended up having a riot on campus when Milanopolis came. Uh, it turns out the riot was uh, as much caused, more caused by the Antifa than it was by Proud Boys, who came back for the next event, and yet, you know, reflected the fact that you could have uh, 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 um, people from both the far left and the far right who. Uh, certainly didn't want to have free speech if it wasn't going to go in their direction. Uh, now, what did this? What did, what what do I learn from this about uh, about how you, how you deal in the present moment with some of these kinds of challenges and crises? One is, I think that you know, free speech and academic freedom are as important as they ever were. I think they have to be protected. I think they are under assault in a particular kind of way. But I also think that universities have to kind of look at themselves and seriously evaluate whether and to what extent they have invited the scrutiny of people from the outside by not being consistent and uh, and by not you know stressing uh, uh, the, the the preeminent importance of the educational values that at the end of the day I assign to this title that I use the city of intellect that's what it's all about to have a city of intellect you have to have intellectual freedom but you also have to be able to uh, to focus on what it is that means, and possibly let go of some of the things that uh, that we come to think are uh, necessary parts of education, whether it's a climbing wall, uh, or you know, or or an overly solicitous uh, 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 staff in in your student affairs office. Uh, we might have to go back to fundamentals and um, uh, and you know heal heal ourselves, and then uh, and then really advocate or the importance of what the university does in, in this country and indeed in the world at large. So actual last quick question then. So when it comes to intellectual, um, the intellectual nature of the university, could you define what safety means in that context? Because this safety concept, especially post-October 7th, has what's gotten everyone basically in the potential to be hypocritical, where you know, I could, I, you could argue it, but that's why this is difficult. You could argue it both ways. You could argue, you'd say, look, like right now, there's very much like a culture of uh, the, the free speech side is swung towards like the pro-Israel side away from, you know, sort of at the pro-Palestinian side, we could find a bunch of incidents, but I think you could very clearly argue that, hey, like taking down the posters or the various statements that on the pro-Palestinian side could definitely make, um, my last name's Kozlov, I'm Jewish, despite the, the looks. So I could definitely see where someone could say, hey, like, I feel unsafe as a Jew on campus. What we're clearly debating around is the term safety. How would you define safety? Because that, that seems to be where the opportunity for hypocrisy comes in very quickly. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And you can argue this uh, every which way. And you can find examples to you know, to, to predicate your argument. So it's not, and not just in a both sidery way, like you can actually no. literally find fair. Totally. I mean, absolutely. And, and I think therefore it's, it's, it's very easy to be glib about it, but it's, it's a really, really intractable kind of question right now. But that being said, you know, I, I you know, to speak to the, you know, to the, to the kind of, you know, 
um, the moment uh, where you have you know three college presidents who find it impossible to come out and just say something very clear and definitive that calling for the genocide of Jews, indeed calling for the genocide of any population on campus or off, uh, is against it's against college rules. It's you know it's 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 not acceptable. That is not, you know, then to get into a debate over the meaning of, you know, uh, Free Palestine or Intifada or, uh, you know, any number of other slogans that may or may not have meanings that are assigned to them by one group as opposed to another. Uh, but you don't, you don't, you don't start there. You have to start with certain kinds of very clear lines, very clear statements about what is acceptable and what isn't. But then once you once you start there. You have to also accept that um, not everybody's going to feel safe all the time. People are going to be offended, and they have been offended by things going on in universities forever. I mean, you know, when I was first teaching, there was a colleague of mine who was a his historian of a European historian of, of Christianity who said he always had some fundamentalist Christians in his class who were offended because he talked about the fact that the Bible was shaped and interpreted differently over time, and uh, and 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 you know, by 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 talking about the history of Christianity, he seemed to suggest that you know it it some of the fundamentals changed uh, in fundamental ways, which um, could be offensive to to some. There's always going to be some level of offense taken, and uh, and 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 to be totally comfortable, to feel, in other words, perhaps totally safe, may not be possible. But a certain level of safety, a certain level of uh, of, 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 of absolute, uh, you know, commitment on the part of the university to, uh, 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 to values that include, uh, 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 um, according people, the, the, the right to feel that whoever they are, they have an equal right to be there and participate in, in this, in this city of intellect, uh, that, that, that's fundamental. And again, you know, where you draw the lines, how you draw the lines, these are all things that are going to be argued about. But if you can't have these arguments in universities, where can you have them? Very well said. Nick, thank you so much for joining me on The Realignment. The book is City of Intellect, The Uses and Abuses of the University. Thank you, Marshall. Really appreciate it.